we had fun with the UI. So for, for those who haven't seen it, it's literally a wormhole. It, as soon as you drop your files on the page, it sucks you into a wormhole and kind of uh, like wishes you through the wormhole. <laughs> Node Congress is almost here. Mark your calendars for April 4 and 5 to join one of the biggest JavaScript backend conferences in the world. To help you progress in your career, I caught up with a few speakers to learn about their passions and how they became rock stars of the Node.js ecosystem. Today we are meeting with Feroz. He has a knack for identifying gaps in the market and creating innovative solutions. His work has significantly improved the Node.js ecosystem and he has successfully created business ventures. So let's hear what he has to share. Very nice to see you here. I've done a lot of research into you and you've done a lot of work on uh, the JavaScript ecosystem. You're very popular on a lot of platforms. For example, on GitHub, you have around 14K, so 14K followers. Uh, you've built a lot of systems for the JavaScript community. So could you give a brief introduction of yourself and your experience with Node.js? Yeah. So uh, my name is Faras, and I've been uh, doing open source for pretty much my whole career. Uh, I um, started uh, right out of college. Um, I was really interested in peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking at the beginning. Uh, started this project called WebTorrent, which was a uh, BitTorrent implementation in the browser. Uh, what it let mm -hmm. people do is basically they could you know land on a website, uh, watch a video, or or stream some content without needing to install any applications on their computer, uh, and it would do this in a peer to peer way using the the torrent network. Um, that was uh, I don't know just I've always found um, you know the idea of of you know a decentralized systems like that really interesting. People working together even though they don't trust each other, um, and the kind of security implications in the code required to kind of uh, make those systems work is super fascinating to me. Um, and that was kind of what, what, um, what I worked on for, for a super long time. Um, while, while building that, I ended up uh, writing a whole bunch of different open source projects, um, different uh, packages on NPM, I think over 100 by the end. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and just um, you know, kind of uh, found myself uh, you know, one of these open source maintainers that ha have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, downloads and uh, yeah, it was super eye-opening. It was a really fun experience, and uh, you know, and and I, uh, I, you know, I couldn't believe uh, really be before I knew it how many different folks were using my my code, uh, and and it was it was kind of honestly a little bit scary at first to to know like all these big companies you know uh, started using my code, and and uh, you know it was it felt like a lot of responsibility honestly, um, and um, yeah, and uh, and then following that it kind of uh, went into. Um, security and uh, started this company called Socket, which I think we're going to talk a little bit about later. Yep. You also built uh, standard JS. So, what was the story there? How did that happen? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I was just tired of, of getting pull requests from people who, you know, they made good code changes, but they weren't following the code style in the project. And so I, you know, I originally just said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add ESLint to my project, like a lot of people have, mm -hmm. you know, done before. But um, because WebTorrent was written in a super modular way, there were about 15, 20 packages that needed to get the same ESLint configuration. And I wanted to basically codify that style once so I wouldn't have to paste a 200 line JSON file into every project. And so I created uh, this NPM package called standard. And you, all you had to do was install standard and then run that command, one command, standard, and it would just tell you if your code style passed or not. Uh, and so it really was a wrapper around ESLint. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of backstory there is that the name was a bit of a joke. Uh, I, I called it, uh, I was trying to think of what to call this. Uh, and, you know, I was going to call it Feroz's code style, something like that, uh, or, or, or WebTorrent code style. But in the end, I thought uh, calling it the standard code style would be super funny because it's obviously just my own code style. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I noticed the name standard was available and no one had, had registered it yet. So I just registered the name and called it JavaScript Standard Style, and um, the rest is history. Uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, found it and thought it was a good style guide. They loved that it ended all the debates on their team uh, around style, and they loved that it wasn't configurable. Like if you use Standard, you either pass or you fail, and there's no there's no options. So you know, there's no uh, endless debates, tweaking of the settings, any of that kind of stuff. And so I, I didn't, you know, like I said, I didn't intend this to become a thing that was popular, but. Uh, kind of accidentally, uh, people liked it, and for reasons I didn't even expect, and and uh, and, and it became uh, really popular. I think 
Um, it was at one point, it was the most popular or maybe the second most popular um, style guide, uh, like in mm-hmm. the whole community. So, uh, so yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny which of these projects you work on end up taking off and which don't. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's just an accident, <laughs> like, like in the case of Standard. <laughs> so nowadays you are working on uh, socket.dev. Um, how, how did you get started on that? And uh, what's the main offering there? Yeah, so you know, I, I you know, I like I mentioned, um, you know, I've been an open source maintainer for for quite a while. So I've really seen how the sausage is made when it comes to uh, making packages. You know, like how do maintainers actually make these things and what the security practices are that go into them. And honestly, I, I was pretty terrified by a lot of the stuff that I saw. Uh, so when I was working on uh, I was working on this product that had pretty high security requirements, and I started looking around for, you know, how do I really know that the open source packages that we're using in this project are actually safe. You know, I mean, you can do everything from the coding side, you know, you can write really secure code, you can review your teammates code really closely with code review, you can do a lot of these things, but uh, at the end of the day, 90% of the code in your application is going to come in from open source dependencies. That's like Mm -hmm. very true across the board. And so if, uh, you know, if, 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 you're scrutinizing super closely the 10% of the code that you write, but you're ignoring the 90% of the code that you just bring in from your dependencies. You're really, really missing a lot there. And um, I I have to say, like, you know, like I said, because I've been an open source maintainer, I know how these things work. And a lot of the time, you know, security is sort of an afterthought. Um, You know, there's a lot of ways that open source community works that aren't the best for security. Um, they're good for other reasons. Like for example, when you add a new person as a collaborator on a project, it's really good for the project. A lot of the times it, it means that there's now more maintainers to take care of issues and stuff like that. But you also see lots of examples where, you know, that, um, process of adding a new collaborator can lead to, um, malicious code getting added into a package. So we've seen that many, many times in, in the open source, um, community and NPM, uh, specifically. Um, so, uh, so that's that's basically where Socket comes from. The idea is how can we help developers to choose better dependencies and avoid um, risks that come from dependencies. So we um, we detect vulnerabilities like a lot of tools do, but I gotta say developers are pretty, often pretty tired of, of fixing vulnerabilities and vulnerable dependencies. A lot of times it's noisy, it's not useful. Um, so we try to hone in on just the ninety, like eliminate the bottom ninety five percent of vulnerabilities that don't mm-hmm. really matter, that don't affect your security, and we just focus on the 5% that are actually important. Um, And then the other thing we do is um, we detect malicious dependencies. Uh, So this is something that no other tooling does. um, And it's really, honestly, if you think about it, it's a much more important uh, type of uh, attack to worry about because it's intentional. Like a malicious dependency is intentionally going to attack you. It's going to run bad code on your machine. It's going to steal your API keys, your tokens. It's going to send them to the attacker. And so they're it's much more uh, important that you avoid v- malicious dependencies uh, than that you v- avoid these kind of vulnerable dependencies that could theoretically be used to attack you in the future. Um, and so because of that, we end up being a much m- more friendly tool for developers to use uh, and help them really pick those, those good dependencies and avoid, uh, you know, avoid like problem dependencies, basically. Whether it's a security or even just like a quality and maintenance perspective, we'll, we'll help them avoid those, those um, unmaintained bad packages basically one feature that i like about socket is how it determines if a particular package has changed its behavior significantly for example it's starting to make a network call previously it wasn't making network call that sounds very similar to how when you install an app on on ios as an example uh, it asks you this application is going to use your location are you okay with this kind of thing whereas with with node.js it's pretty much once you install javascript and you run it in node you have all the permissions of node uh, do you think that this is something that node node might tackle in the future as well or is that still going to continue to be like a free for all kind of system yeah that's a great question um so node has actually done an experimental uh, feature called uh, security policies which allows mm-hmm. you to lock down the dependencies uh, and what they can do. Um, it's a pretty cool feature. I'm glad they're working on it. But um, I have to say, at least today, it's pretty hard to use. You have to basically go in and write a policy that covers every single one of your dependencies and what permissions it's allowed to do. And this is something that you know uh, just isn't feasible in most pe- most teams because you're dealing with you know thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dependencies. Uh, so. 
you know, I think we offer a much more practical solution today. Uh, it's a GitHub app. You can install it in the GitHub Marketplace. Uh, we're one of the top 50 apps that have, you know, that are in the whole marketplace. You just install it in two clicks, and then you get uh, protection across all your repositories. Uh, and then, the, you know, the coolest part is it works right in GitHub. So when you open a pull request, Socket will come in and leave a comment if uh, any of your dependencies are uh, risky. So it'll say, hey, this dependency will steal all your environment variables and uh, all your secrets when you when you run it. And it'll tell you that in the PR so you know not to not to merge it. <laughs> so it's pretty it's pretty useful uh, in, in that way. You're presenting at the Node Congress. Uh, what inspired your special session and what are you presenting? Yeah, so I'm going to be sharing uh, some really cool work that we're doing at, at Socket uh, around uh, using LLMs to detect um, malicious, uh, you know, uh, code in, in dependencies. So I think mm -hmm. one of the things I'm most excited about is, you know, LLMs are, are you know, I guess they, they sort of bursted onto the scene a little over a year ago with ChatGPT and, and really captured everyone's imagination. And... Uh, I think there's like really just we're starting to see just the beginnings of what people are going to be able to do with this technology. And so part of part of my excitement for this talk is I just want to I just want to share with developers how we're using LLMs because I think it's really um, it's it's different than a lot of uh, other uh, use cases I've seen. You know, you'll see a lot of things around like people building these chatbots uh, and building chat interfaces for their for their apps. Uh, and that's cool, but it's it's really not um, it's missing. I think a lot of the uh, potential for what this technology can do. Like it's not just about the chat interface. It's really about like I think that you know the the part that's underappreciated is these LLMs can actually do like human level uh, analysis of 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 code. Right? You can actually ask it questions about code and figure out what the code is doing, what the risks of that that behavior might be, in a way that can actually help developers to do their jobs better. And so we're using mm -hmm. it in a pretty cool way. And so I just want to share that with people, and I'm I'm really um, excited to for, to show them that. And then I also I also really want to uh, leave people with a bunch of really concrete steps for how they can improve their security. So obviously um, I'm gonna touch on a little bit of kind of what we're doing at Socket, but, but more than that, there's a bunch of other things that people should be doing uh, when they're um, writing code in Node.js, and I want to just make sure I leave people with a really good set of concrete, easy-to-do steps that they can take today to really improve their security, especially with the way they use dependencies. So I'm going to try and make it really practical and really, um, really useful for people. I like the extra things that Socket does as well in terms of supporting the community. One example of an application that you guys have built is wormhole.app. Uh, what's the story there? Yeah, so it's actually a good, great question. So wormhole.app is, is uh, it's what was the precursor to Socket, actually. So um, we started building wormhole, uh, which is uh, a secure way to send files across the internet. Um, it solves the problem that we've all had where, you know, I just want to get a, fi a file from one laptop, you know, my computer to another friend's computer, and we're sitting right next to each other, but I somehow can't figure out in 2024 how to send files across the internet uh, in a quick, easy way. Uh, and, you know, and there's a famous XKCD about this and how, uh, you know, uh, why is this still a problem? Uh, you know, in, I think even when that comic came out, it was 10 years ago. So anyway, uh, it's a problem we still have. And, um, and so uh, we built a tool that is basically the easiest possible way to do this. So you, you open up our site, no user account needed, no uh, login, anything like that. You just drop your files on the page and they get automatically um, encrypted with end-to-end -end encryption so the service doesn't see your files at all. And then we generate a link that you can send to the other device or you can even scan a QR code if you want. And uh, then the recipient can just start to download the file right away. And the best part is um, it's super fast. So there's no um, um, kind of, you don't even have to wait for the files to upload to the cloud because we use uh, WebTorrent behind the scenes, uh, which allows us to stream the files between the devices. So that means uh, I could be 1% uploaded to the cloud, uh, but mm -hmm. you start opening the site and you want to start downloading right now. Well, you can click download and it'll actually start sending data directly device to device. Uh, so it's basically the fastest possible way to send files, um, but it also has the convenience of the cloud where, you know, say that the recipient isn't online at the same time as me uploading it, you know, I can still finish the upload, close my browser, and then they have 24 hours to download it before it's uh, automatically deleted. So 
Uh, anyway, we're, I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's one of the coolest, uh, you know, most... Uh, the UI is amazing. It, it's, uh, it's pretty trippy. <laughs> yeah, we had fun with the UI. So for, for those who haven't seen it, it's literally a wormhole. It, as soon as you drop your files on the page, it sucks you into a wormhole and kind of uh, like whooshes you through the wormhole. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> some, people, some people love it, some people hate it, but uh, I think it's, it's, it was pretty fun to make it. So uh, we, we kept it. <laughs> you know, uh, the reason why we ended up uh, building Socket was was actually because of that experience building Wormhole where we wanted to make the, the product really, really secure. And we had sort of exhausted the list of all the obvious security things to do. You know, we used a really strong content security policy. We used, uh, you know, uh, really careful about choosing our dependencies. Um, we, we, we had multiple code reviews on, on all the code we wrote. Um, we did a bunch of really good things, but, but uh, we still had this problem that we all have, which is I still have... 2,000 packages in my node modules folder, and what is that code even doing? I don't know who wrote it. I don't know. Uh, and I update it constantly, right? Every couple of days, I, I emerge a, a dependabot PR. So I'm just constantly changing that code, and who knows what it's doing, right? So that's the problem we, uh, we designed uh, a Socket to, to solve. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of funny how um, you know, we, we just started solving one problem and found our way to uh, something completely different. All right. Thank you so much. It was really enjoyable. Uh, and thank you for watching.